What's up, everybody, and welcome to Man Enough Mondays, where every single Monday I'm hanging out with friends of mine, and we are talking about how we can not just become better men, but better humans. And today's episode is near and dear to my heart because I'm a dad, and we're talking about fatherhood. And uh, I can tell you, as a man, this has been quite an interesting experience to be balancing the blessing of being able to work from home during this pandemic, but also the challenges that come with doing that while being a dad. And so uh, I have my cup of coffee here because one thing you know you need as a father or a parent in general is caffeine. Uh, And I have some amazing friends with me today who I'm so excited. First of all, you know him as the Angel Cass on Supernatural, but this guy, uh, he is a real life superhero. We've been circling each other for years. We know so many of the same people. He's used his platform to make a massive difference. He's got a nonprofit called Random Acts. It's inspiring Random Acts of Kindness all over the world. Uh, my new friend, Misha Collins. What's up, buddy? How are you? I'm good. I, uh, I, I, almost, I almost missed this, uh, this podcast Zoom call this morning because I went mountain biking and uh, took a wrong turn. So I'm actually still, I was just <laughs> like before getting on here, I was literally <laughs> scraping mud off my face um but i'm good i'm i'm uh settling into this weird pandemic moment and i'm so happy to be here talking to you about this really looking forward to seeing what we can unearth here Mm, thank you my man and uh and also joining us he's uh he's a friend of mine he i think if i'm not mistaken he wrote the actual book on manhood um uh He's the star of Brooklyn Nine-Nine and Everybody Hates Chris, but he's so much more than his acting or his dancing pecs that everybody loves. He's an advocate. He's an ally. He's an inspiration to not just me, but men and women all over the globe. My man, Terry Crews. How are you, Hey, what's up, guys? This is good to be here. I love this subject matter. I love breaking things down, man. Let's figure out how to help us. Help us. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I'm trying well, to say that without I mean, crying. I, I'll say it with a tear. Right? <laughs> Someone help us. All right, kicking it off real quick, both of you. Uh, what has been your biggest dad fail during quarantine? I think my biggest one, and this is wild because again, I've had uh, I have five kids, four daughters, and one son, and three of and them. Are they all at home? No, this is the deal. They're adults. My oldest daughter is 33. Then I have a 30 year old. Then I have a 21 year old. Then I have a 17 year old and a 14 year old boy. Okay, so I've been on this thing for generations. (laughs) It's like, (laughs) you know what I mean? Decades of fatherhood. What's happened though, and the biggest mistake I have been doing and had to stop was, you know how you get on this advice train and you can't stop? And he's you mean, dying. You mean, the, you mean the, the, the one where you feel like it's the Holy Spirit coming through you? you th- yeah, you, you're like, I'm giving this man all the information right now. Like, like, and you realize it's been 25 minutes and you're still going and he's still nodding. And yeah. I'm like, do you understand? He's like, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. He, and he's being really polite. He's, he's being a very respectful kid. But I was like, oh my God, dude, I just overwhelmed this kid with way too much info. Because you think, you know, you, you're like, I better get it all in now. You know what I mean? Like, and I realized that I had to, this is the biggest mistake. One thing I had to do is keep everything short. Just mm-hmm. say what it is you what what it is you see, what it is that you have, the advice you have, and kick and stop it. Like make yourself shut up. So you can listen. And the problem is, is that when I'm with my son, I start pontificating and, da, 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 and when I was a boy and, da, da, and, and you could just see him just, uh, this, this, our eyes just start to glaze. And yeah. I was like, now I knew <clears throat> and now, and now we're in quarantine. So it's not like he can run away. Not like he can go outside. <laughs> He's a captive yeah. audience. He's stuck. And so that was that was my big, and I, I had to stop. And I, and I told him, I said, hey, man, stop me. Just stop me. I, I promise I will. I get on these trains and I'm so, so sorry. So now 
I give myself a little like two minute thing and then, okay, okay, run out of the room, you know, be, go to the, go to another room. So that was my bite size content, bite size. That's all the four, bite that's size. all those teenagers can handle now, man. Bite size <laughs> content. Misha, what about you, man? Um, well, I mean, I don't really know where to start in terms of parenting failures <laughs> during quarantine. I could give you a laundry <laughs> list here. Oh, actually, I have one. I have a. I, hold on, I just I realized I have a perfect visual example of a, <laughs> of a parenting failure. I'll start with this. It's right out the window here. I I don't know. Can you guys see that? It looks like some construction debris. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. like an antenna yeah. or something. Yeah, that's a. I I decided it was like a moment of feeling like a parenting success where I decided to build a trebuchet, a, a catapult, with my son, and then. <laughs> And then it almost immediately fell down the hill and, uh, <laughs> and has actually driven a wedge between my wife and I. Um, <clears throat> but I, uh, I think one interesting uh, parenting failure slash lesson that I seem to, as a father, have to keep relearning um, is to, to stop resisting parenting. I remember when <clears throat> my daughter was... Uh, an infant and a toddler, it was usually my responsibility to put her to sleep. And I would, and she needed to be rocked to sleep. So I would stand there and I'd bounce her and I'd sing to her and I'd, and I'd count in my head, like down from a hundred. Like if I count down from a hundred, this will be over and then I'll be able to put her down and, and go do something else. Um, and I was, I was always resisting the process of where I was at the moment with the kids. Um, mm. just wanting to be somewhere else, wanting to be done with it. And I noticed at the beginning of home quarantine for us, it's been about two months here in Washington. And, uh, the very beginning of, of this quarantine, I was trying to set the kids up with something and then make a little time for myself and, you know, kind of not sink into things with them. I was trying to, was trying to quarantine myself from the kids but but trying to resist the process of like all right this is where we are right now and not i just wasn't accepting that this was where we are and uh and it was a, it was like i had to learn that lesson again i of course am not i've not mastered the practice of being present with the children but i've noticed that when i can step into it's okay i'm i'm here with you right now what do you want to do? To, let's make a trebuchet, even if it's going to fall down the hill. You know, um, it's an interesting thing for me as a parent. I think it's been a failure here in quarantine, but it's been a failure throughout my parenthood that and a lesson that I have to keep relearning. Don't don't mm -hmm. resist this moment, because also at some point when I was balancing my daughter, I realized at some point she's not going to let me rock her to sleep anymore. There's going to be a last time that I do this, and then I'm going to wish I had it back. Misha, I, I feel that you know when I, right when I became a parent, somebody told me this quote that stuck with me the whole time, which is, "Being a parent is the only time you feel true nostalgia for the present." Mm -hmm. And and it's something that I've I think my biggest parenting struggle and fail isn't just in quarantine. For me, it's also been this constant feeling like I'm missing out in the present moment. Because I am seeing them grow and change. My kids are younger, so I'm the baby dad here. I'm my daughter's going to be five next month, and my son's two and a half. But like in quarantine, as you guys know, somehow some of us got busier, and other people um, have had their jobs taken away. Yeah. And for those of us that have gotten busier, there's a separate challenge, which is like, well, there's this fear that comes up that I think exists for all of us men, and maybe you guys can talk about this a little bit. But this fear of not being able to provide not knowing what the world's going to look like in three months or eight months or a year, if our entertainment business is going to fall apart and just doing whatever we can now to kind of, you know, finish the book, get the money, whatever we can do. And all the while, like hearing my kids in that back room screaming for daddy or knocking on the door, I can't even tell you how many times they've screamed and cried and knocked on the door, whether I'm doing this or something else. And I just feel like I'm missing. I'm like, I feel like I'm doing quarantine wrong. I'm like, shit, I should just be with my kids. Fuck all the work. It's all good. But my brain, I don't know if it's masculinity or what it is. I'm not able to kind of like process how to do that. I'm curious if you guys have any of these feelings come up for yourselves. This is what I tell a, a lot of new dads and the whole thing, man. Dude, it's fast. 
It's so fast. Over. Fast. Like, as difficult as you think that is. I mean, you're like, oh, man, they pooped again. They're all over the place. They got in it. In a... Dude, they're gone. It is like that. Dude, my 33-year-old, dude, is gone. I mean, and that was gone 17 years ago. You know what I mean? But for her. <laughs> and then you're like, holy cow, they're grown. They're living their lives. It was so fast. When did it go? My wife and I were actually looking at video of 20 years ago. And when they were all little and the whole thing, and we're like, what happened? What happened? Like, it's at the moment you're in it, it feels like forever. And this is what I want to remind everyone, even about this quarantine. It's like that. It's like, you can't see the sun move across the sky. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? You have no, you can't watch that tree grow, but it's growing. It's moving. Yeah. It's happening. And we are one step closer to something else very quickly. So, and what hit me really hard, even about what you said, man, it's like, I yearn for that time when they were knocking on my door. You know mm. what I mean? I yearn for that time when they were bothering me. Now, this is another thing, and I gotta, I gotta bring this up. I was a very, very angry dad, okay? Because I took everything way too seriously. Everything was the, the it was the, the most important thing, you know, what school they went to, what kindergarten they had, what food they were eating, what this and that, that, that. I, dude, you can care too much. Mm. And what happened is I became very angry. I became very, it, it's, it's a weird thing because there's punishment and then there's discipline. Discipline is when you just instruct and is train your kids. But punishment is when you are always on their ass about every little thing. So it be, every thing becomes punishment. And for my mm. daughters, and this was another thing about having four girls straight in a row. And there was a really, you know, there were a lot of miscommunications. I mean, there were times where I'm, I'm driving around with them and I'm, I'm thinking everything's cool. And they like, I said, you had a good time? Like, yeah. And then they go home and tell their mom, he didn't even say anything to me. And I'm like, what? You said everything was good. I don't understand. You know. And it would be this big thing that they would always come home and tell their mom what really happened. You know, and I'm going, but I thought we, it was all cool. I thought everything was great. And but what I realized is that just like kind of what I was saying earlier, I was just giving this knowledge of a dad and all this stuff. And mm -hmm. I wasn't listening. I was not listening. I always have to be reminded to listen and enjoy these moments and take these time. And, and again, with this quarantine, it's really, really made me settle down and just say, man, listen to these kids. You know what I mean? Listen to what they have to mm -hmm. say. How does fear play into fatherhood for you? Because for me, I think that's one of the, if I'm, if I'm really honest with myself, I'm not just trying to chase my dream. I'm also being driven all, by fear, by fear that I'm not going to be able to provide. Um, how, how does fear play into your roles as dads? And also maybe like, how does the quarantine and specifically COVID-19 kind of um, play into your fear? Well, I think, I think I can, I can speak to the fear as uh, as a as a provider or or fear based provider uh, mentality, um, I, I was raised by you know a single mom on welfare. We were homeless at times. There was a lot of scarcity in my childhood. A lot of love, a lot of great adventures, um, but it was also not terribly secure. And I know that I bring um, a scarcity mentality to my parenting and. And I've been working my ass off for the last 10 years, uh, which is basically the full length of my <clears throat> son's life. And I've been missing a lot of the opportunity to really show up as a parent because uh, partly because of that fear. Uh, mm -hmm. It's not everything. It's not the, that's not the complete picture, but I think yeah. there is a little bit of this mentality of like, I've got to, I've got, I've got to make hay while the sun shines. I've got to do this work. This is really important. And, it, it, and that, that mindset has allowed me to 
more often than not set aside my kids for later. Because I think yeah. I th this is work right now. This is really important. That can wait. And then the next thing you know, it's 10 years later and your son is already starting <laughs> starting to move on and you're like wait i mean you, you know it's I, you, it's very easy to miss a childhood um with that mindset yeah. um and it's something that i you know i'm still guilty of and it's happening here during quarantine as well um and i do try to remind myself as often as i can remember you know when when one of them is like hey dad will you play catch with me i will often my my reflexive response is often no i've got shit to do I've got important shit to do. And then I have to be like, wait, 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 wait. Yes. Okay. Go, go play catch. Um, even for a little bit. Um, mm. But it's challenging. It's a challenging balance. And I think that it's true for all parents. I, I know that my wife experiences the same thing. I don't know that it's necessarily um, just a, a, a father's curse. I think it has to do with, you know, That's being parenting, parents in yeah. the modern world. Yeah. Well, I got to say for one that, uh, thank you, Misha, for that, because uh, I've been there where, you know, I had three jobs at the same time. I was, you know, and a lot of times things weren't filming in L.A., so I wasn't home. I was gone for six, seven months at a time, you know, mm -hmm. and out of that fear, I was like, OK, the jobs are coming. Take them, you know. Uh, but then I would come home and I, and I would have to rediscover my family every time. You know, mm -hmm. it was weird. I mean, my, you know, my daughters had their own systems, their own ways to go. And, and I was like, oh, y'all doing that? Where, where, where do I fit in here? And I felt like an interloper, you know what I mean? Um, and that was hard. That was very, very hard. Um, and I, there were times where I even felt, uh, you know, just in their dismissal of me a little bit, um, I started to feel sorry for myself a little, you know, where you where you just kind of like, okay, well, nobody cares about me, you know. What I mean, <laughs> you know, I, I I like to call it the new baby syndrome, you know, when the new baby comes around, you're like, hey, well, what about me? Hey, well, so you just go pay attention to her, huh? You know, and I wanted my Scooby snacks, you know what I mean? I wanted yeah. my stuff, you know, and um, that's dude. And what's crazy is that. You know, th th there's a great quote that said, I feared a great many things in life, tons of things, and most of them never happened. And that really summed it up. All the things I thought we were going to lose this and blah, blah, blah. turns out not only did they not happen, but the things that I thought I was going to lose turned out to not be that important. You know what I mean? I'll share something that I just did with you guys. I reached my breaking point um on thursday night last week mm -hmm. i was going live every single night to just try to show up for people for the last 40 days i went live and talked to my fans and was just putting so much energy out in the world and just trying to like you know as we all do in our own ways use our platforms responsibly to help because there's been so much pain and i was neglecting myself and my own family you know that time was the time for me and my wife but i was giving it to my you know however many people and all day long I've been working and I know you guys have been in similar situations. And so we just had this thing where it was like, are we doing this all wrong? When are we going to ever get this chance again? Can we use this as an opportunity? And so we're doing like, I'm doing four hours, four and a half hours a day now starting earlier and then leaving my whole afternoons open for my kids. Because like you, Misha, I'm like, I am missing them as they are here. And I'm watching Terry, what you're saying is they're just, my daughter looked like she was 13 yesterday. She's four and a half. I was like, yeah. when did you grow up? Scary, man. Yeah. You don't see it happening and then it's there. It's just so bizarre. Um, I want to ask you guys, are you guys leaving the house? Are you going out? What, how, what's your, what is your parenting fatherhood situation look like right now? It's challenging. So I feel fortunate to be in this kind of natural environment. Um, but yeah, you get a little stir crazy. And oh, I mean, it's an interesting cabin fever that happens. Um, I love my family, but I'm really sick of them. 
<laughs> That's good. Oh man, you're so good. <laughs> you know, he said that on the no. I, you know, he he spoke that one for me, man. I felt that with my whole chest. Uh, on a serious note, actually, a month before the whole COVID shutdown, my wife was diagnosed as having breast cancer. So oh. what happened was literally she was very very proactive. You got to understand, my wife is my hero. She was amazing. And she was very proactive. So two weeks before the shutdown, two weeks after the diagnosis, she got, we, she received a double mastectomy. And we didn't know wow. the whole thing was going to shut down. I literally was shooting AGT and running home to her, okay? I mean, going to the hospital as she was in the hospital recovering. And then the shutdown happened. So you got to understand, the hospital was locked up. But we had just got out of there before all of this, before all of the, the, the hospitals started to get the corona patients and the whole thing. Mm -hmm. So, but also I was here alone with her and my son. And I had been her nurse for this whole time, for eight weeks straight. I wow. have been her nurse. And I mean, cooking, cleaning, laundry. And there were times I had to go to the grocery store but I would put my mask on, put my hat on, have my gloves and the whole thing. And, you know, kept my hand sanitizer and all this stuff. And I did everything I could do. Uh, but there, because there was just things we needed. There was just things because right then, remember, it was a big panic. There was no toilet yeah. paper. There was no paper towel. I mean, you go there and, and all the shelves were bare. It was yeah. nuts in that nuts. first week or two. And, and I had a recovering wife. And my son, and we were just like, what is going well, on? And, and you were also like, you were going live and you were doing your stuff. Like I was watching you. Yeah. I had no idea that you were dealing with all that. How did you balance it all? Well, I mean, there was no balance. You, you just have to, you know what you, what, you know what happens? Is that you just figure out what you can do more than you thought you ever could. You know, this is the deal, man. Most of the time, you don't you don't die from it from what's happening. You die from a broken heart because what happens is your hope and all the stuff that you thought was going to happen doesn't. And so you die from that. But when you realize, just stay open. This is the greatest quote, man. I heard another anonymous quote. It is said that sometimes your greatest hopes are destroyed to prepare you for something better. Now, mm. I've been holding on to that for this whole time because you, you I mean, the, the, the nightmare of what cancer is. I mean, hearing, but you know, my wife and I have been through everything, man. We have lost homes, we've lost children. Uh, and now this cancer diagnosis, we're like, you know, and people are like, Terry Crews got the life, man. This has got to be, man. but we know we're like, man, let's, let's, we're, we're battling this and now we're battling that and now we're battling this. But she really was my hero in this because I could have broke down really fast had she broke down. You understand what I mean? Like, but it was yeah. all about how she handled it that woke me up. It was kind of like, pop, pop, stop, you know. Listen, we're going to go in here, we're going to take this, and we're going to attack. And she was like mm. this warrior with a sword. And it made me feel like, man, that kind of bravery, I'm all good. And dude, she's cancer free right now. Oh, thank God. 100%. Man. Fully wow. recovering and doing all the amazing things. It's so good. But I, when I this is another thing when I look at this quarantine, I told her, you know, and this is selfish of me, but uh, you know, I told her, I said, hey, God shut the world down so that I could take care of you, you know, because all mm -hmm. I can think about is what about Rebecca? What about Rebecca? What about Rebecca? And then I thought about my son, like, wh what is he? How is he handling this? What is? What, you know what I mean? Because they're they're gonna yeah. tell you they're okay, but it comes yeah. out other ways. You know what I mean? Oh yeah. <laughs> Terry, thank you for sharing that, man. And we're so happy that your wife is uh, cancer free. What a blessing. And then it's, oh. you know, again, like, and in many ways, I'm, I'm sure you feel this way, but you had the chance, God slowed down the world so uh, you could take care of her. But I'm sure you felt over the course of your marriage, she's been the one that's taking care of you. Oh, definitely. So it's like, it's like this beautiful kind of reciprocation that's finally able to happen. But the strength of our women is such that we need the world to shut down to take care of our wife. <laughs> well, that, that's what my wife <laughs> said. She said, 
they can do it. Without she told me, she was like, wait a minute, does it take cancer for you to treat me like this? I was like, oh, damn, <laughs> that hurt. That really hurt. Oh. <laughs> I was thinking about something you were uh, mentioning earlier, Justin, about, you know, finding, you know, that, that scarcity mentality and like working so hard. And I think it's an interesting thing that we need to find a balance in, in this um, because, and I, and I think this is particularly, I'm sure true of the three of us, you know, we're obviously creative people. We want to have that aspect of our lives fulfilled, that public facing creative spirit needs to be satisfied in some way. And if we shut that down totally to just take care of the kids or just show up for the family, right. we're gonna wilt on the vine and we're actually not going to show up as good fathers and husbands because we're going to be resentful and 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 pissed off yep. and wanting to be somewhere else. So you yeah. have to take care of that. You have to satisfy that aspect of your personality to a certain extent. Um, but at the same time, if that's all you do, your you your relationship with your family is going to wilt on the vine, and mm. uh, and it's a balancing act. And I've been noticing that that's a, a tough thing to juggle during quarantine. I've been getting up at five o'clock in the morning. So I have a couple hours before anyone wakes up. So I have my me time. But then, then I notice I'm actually just exhausted for the rest of the day. And, you know, <laughs> I'm kind of like a walking ghost with the children and my treadmill day falls over. I've been seeing a few people tweet and post this idea that it's okay to be exhausted. You're not working from home. You're working from home during a global pandemic. <laughs> yeah. right. and global health crisis and i and i and i think that we i think that we take for granted this time that we're living in right like we're living in a this is crazy this is yeah. this is like like i remember going to the stores and seeing that just like you terry and being like i'm living in a i've seen this movie yeah like i've seen we we've been here before and we it's almost like we compartmentalize the situations so that we can just keep going but at the end of the day I am so much more tired than I've ever been in my life. Yep. <laughs> like oh, getting up. I, I go to bed at nine o'clock, man. I'm at, at 9 p.m. How? I'm done. How do you go to I'm bed out. at 9 p.m.? How do you I'm do that? I'm out. I'm done. You know what? I'm Once I found out that we were on lockdown for real, I, I mean, I started it like six, seven weeks ago. I said four in the morning every day, simply because I knew I needed the structure. You know yeah. what I mean? The, if, if I did not have the structure, I was going to be all over the place. You know, and I knew I'd be off. Um, and you know, I, I, and I'm gonna bring this up because there's something that they talk about because I had an addiction to pornography. And when I went to rehab for it and the whole thing, they always talk about this, this halt thing where it's when you're hungry, angry, lonely, and tired is when you're more susceptible. And the thing is, is that I'm always cognizant of how I'm feeling. It's just to be careful because what happened was is I was always trying to placate myself with porn. I mean, for years I did that. And then 10 years ago, I've, I've I got, I, too, I got it out of my life. You, you understand what I mean? I even had a, a, a podcast, not a podcast, but a, an Instagram live about a no porn quarantine. You know what I mean? Just I, to, I know I joined and watched it. Exactly. So my thing is, I knew that if I did not have these structures in place, you could end up doing something you don't want to do. You know, you could tip over it because it's so, the pressure and the sadness and the anger and the loneliness and the tiredness and the, you know, it's really gets on you, man. And the world is going through that. And I said, no way, no, no, I got to fight it before it happens. So I started yeah. saying four in the morning and I get my workout in and the whole thing. And then I had to do a lot of lives to keep the structure. You see what I mean? Like, First of all, Justin, I got to tell you, the lives are saving a lot of people right now. Even yeah. yourself. You yeah. need to have that structure. You need to keep busy because if you were just at your home, it, it, look, first of all, my wife, we could talk for a good deep hour. It's kind of like deliberate practice. You ever heard that? Where you can practice all day or you can practice for an hour deliberately and make yeah. sure it's really good and you'll be done. That's the conversations I have with my wife and make sure they're really good combos. And then I'm back on the lives to keep myself going. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And this is the deal. This pandemic, I see people on weed. I see people on alcohol. I see, this is the time that it, the, the, the cure can be worse than the, the, the malady. 
You know what I mean? Yes. Like this quarantine could really develop problems that you could never recover from if you're yeah. not careful. So I've all, I'm like, I'm already writing down, okay, this is what I need to do. This is how I got to be. This is what I got to do. And because I know if I'm not on it, it I, man, I can run around and be a mess. Terry, it's funny you say that. And Misha, I want to, I want to get your opinion. It's funny you say that because when this started, the first two weeks, I was like, oh, I'm good. I'm great, actually. I never had the chance to stay home for two weeks and not have people bother me. And like, yeah. you know, and you guys know how it is, especially when you're an entrepreneur. Misha, you got your nonprofits. We all have our things where people need us constantly. And I got cocky. And I was like, oh, this is fantastic. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work out every day. I'm going to do this. And I, and, I, and I wasn't able to do it. And then those same things started creeping in. Yep. The, 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 the porn, the like, where is this coming from? Yep. And I've had those conversations with my wife. I was introduced to pornography when I was 10 years old, long before I could ever have an erection. So it's been here as a place where you go when you're lonely. That's right. And I wasn't even aware of what was happening to me to my psyche from the outside world. So the structure, when you talk about the structure, I go, ah, yeah. that's what I think, not just me, but so many men are needing to figure out right now is how we can in a time where there's no structure, create structure to become better fathers, yep. to become better husbands. So Misha, what are you doing like that? Well, it's interesting. I think I had the inverse experience of you. Um, my my first couple of weeks were really tough. And I think it was partly because the structures had all been thrown out the window and I had to totally recalibrate and find a new system Got and it, it didn't happen quickly. Um, part of it for me has been waking up early. That seems to really help because it does- What give time do you get up? I've been getting up around five. Um, and it's been giving me a little breathing room before the rest of the house starts stirring. Um, we also got a uh, puppy. <laughs> um, in February, right before this happened, I was just, just this morning, hosing diarrhea off of, off of the dog. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's been a real treat. Um, but, um, yeah, I think those, I think those structures are really critical. I, uh, I've been a, uh, meditator for a long time. It's How long helpful. do you meditate for? Um, from 20 minutes to 45 minutes, uh, in the morning. Right. That's my practice. I used to do. I used to do like an hour every morning at sunrise. That that those days are long. When I had kids, that <laughs> went out the window. It was like if I can get fifteen minutes, it's fine. Yeah, that's been uh, key for me. I worked with this woman who was uh, a Zen monk for a decade, and she told me something that has stuck with me. She said, "You need a certain paternal energy around your creative work and your life." like putting a little fence around a sapling that you've just planted. You need to protect it. And you can do that with mm. firm structures in your daily routine. Wow. So you create these structures that protect the, yeah. the, the more gentle, creative, unfurling energy in your life. But it's this, this firm paternal energy. And I really kind of love that metaphor. And I think it's very true, especially in a situation like this where we – aren't able to rely on external structures. Like we're not, we're no longer, you know, as three actors, we're no longer responding to the call sheet. And when yeah. we have to be at work and a yeah. first AD who's telling us what to do, we're responding to the structures that we create in our daily routine. And if, and if we don't create, if we don't have those structures, uh, things do unravel. I, mm -hmm. I read that alcohol sales are up by like 50% oh, yeah. during the pandemic. But, like people yeah. are unraveling and, you know, a lot of people are in this situation. A lot of people have lost their jobs. It's a time when we need to create structure ourselves. Yep. Mm, this conversation could last for another three hours. I hope I hope you guys are down to maybe have this conversation again or a part two at some point. But in the meantime, uh, I know Terry's got to get back to his family. And Misha, you have to go figure out how to get your... Um, I have to get the diarrhea off the dog and the trebuchet yeah, off the hill. <laughs> but but I, what do you, if you guys could just talk to all of us, speak to the camera and just give us the best advice you can for what, you know, what, how to get through this right now. I'm going to say this to every man out there who is struggling right now, that sometimes your greatest hopes are destroyed to prepare you for something better. 
Um, what's happened right now is that there was a picture that of the world as you knew it, and it's over. Like it's it's and it's not coming back. Like the world is officially different uh, from here on out. Uh, but I'd also like to say that this is biblical times. This is a biblical moment we're experiencing right now. When I think about Passover um, and what that means, you've always heard about it. You always saw it, you know, in the Bible and different stuff. You hear about a Passover. This is truly a modern day Passover. <laughs> this is the thing where we have to sit in the house while the angel of death goes around the world and does its thing. And we have to stay safe for us just a small time. It's temporary. And I want to just really, really reiterate the temporary, this is the temporary nature of what you're going through. Because again, remember, we can't watch the sun go across the sky. You can't watch the tree grow, but it's all happening and moving as we speak. And I just want to tell you, you, you are being prepared for something better right now. I'm telling you that right now, believe me. Well, that felt nice to hear from me. I'm going to take some <laughs> solace in that. Thank you. Yeah, me too, man. <clears throat> Jerry Cruz, you, you need an app where I can just press a button. And go like, <laughs> Pep talk. Just, uh, Jerry, Jerry uh, just pointing at you, telling you you can do it. It feels uh, like anything is possible. I'm with, I, I have a choke app. Like, get in here and you can do this, man. <laughs> I, I wish I would have had that. I'll tell you that. <laughs> Misha, what about you, man? You, uh, I've been talking to a lot of friends, dads, uh, and parents who are struggling with having their kids home, feeling like they're failing with homeschool, feeling like they're too busy or they're not showing up in the way they had hoped to. And I, I have been telling my friends, if, you're, if your kids get through this alive, you've done a good job. <laughs> yes. Don't hold yourself to too high a standard. Yep. This moment is, it's a moment for survival. And if, if, you're, if your six-year-old doesn't know their times tables at the end of this, they're going to be okay. So well said. Jared, thank you. Thank you guys both so much. You really are um, extraordinary men, both of you. And I just really appreciate you guys modeling vulnerability like this. Because I never had this. Like, I didn't, have, I didn't have men like this in my life that I could turn to. And I'm just really grateful that you are providing that opportunity for so many men out there. Wait, the I thought I came um, across as really tough here. You thought I was vulnerable? I thought I was really <laughs> vast. Damn it. Hey, man, vulnerability <laughs> is toughness. Let's be real. Yeah, that's yeah, that's good. That's good. Um, thank you, guys. Uh, I, you know, when we, when we shoot the, the season two of Man Enough, I really hope you guys will come back and, uh, and we can spend more time together and dig in and talk about all this crazy stuff. In the meantime, hold on. I want to show you guys. My family's been out here waiting. Yeah, that's and, good. Uh, Bring them in. Let them in. They are. Hey, oh. there. hey, everybody. Hi. My oh, my gosh. Hi. 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 Whoa. What's up? Look hold at on. that brood. You got, oh. you got to say, what is the thing that we say every night? What's the strongest muscle on your body? My His heart. His oh. heart. Oh, <laughs> Unless you're Terry Crews, and then they all <laughs> the strongest person in the body. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> Special thank you to uh, to Tide Loads of Hope for uh, for taking care of those who are taking care of our country, and for uh, providing free laundry services for all of our first responders in the select cities. Thank you guys for sponsoring this episode, and to both of you, Terry Crews, Misha Collins, Terry Crews, Misha, you guys are the best. Appreciate you. Thank you for being man enough. Love you.